Cancer Ward by Alexander I. Solzhenitsyn. Read to you by Carter Banks. Chapter 11. Cancer of the Birch Tree. In spite of everything, Saturday evening came as a sort of invisible relief to everyone in the cancer wing. No one quite knew why. Obviously, the patients were not released for the weekend from their illness, let alone for thinking about it. But they were freed from talking to doctors and from most of their treatment. And it was probably this which gladdened some eternally childish part of the human makeup. After his conversation with Asya, Dayomka managed to climb the stairs, although the nagging pain in his leg was growing stronger, forcing him to tread more carefully. He entered the ward to find it more than usually lively. All those who belonged to the ward were there. Sibgatov, too. And there were also some guests from the first floor, new arrivals as well as a few he knew, like the old Korean, Ni, who had just been allowed out of the ward. So long as the radium needles were in his tongue, they had kept him under lock and key, like a valuable in a bank vault. One of the new people was a Russian, quite a presentable man with fair, swept black hair, who had something wrong with his throat. He could only speak in a whisper. As it happened, he was sitting on Dionka's bed, taking up half of it. Everyone was listening, even Mersolomov and Egan Birdiv, who didn't understand Russian. Kostoglatov was making a speech. He was sitting not on his bed, but higher up, on his windowsill, emphasizing thereby the importance of the moment. If any of the strict nurses had been on duty, he wouldn't have been allowed to sit there. But Turgeon was in charge, a male nurse whom the patients treated as one of themselves. He rightly judged that such behavior would hardly turn medical science upside down. Resting one stockinged foot on the bed, Kostoglatov put the other leg, bent at the knee, across the knee of the first leg like a guitar. Swaying slightly, he was discoursing loudly and excitedly for the whole ward to hear. There was this philosopher, Descartes, he said. Suspect everything. But that's nothing to do with our way of life, Rusanov reminded him, raising a finger in admonition. No, of course it isn't, said Kostoglatov, utterly amazed by the objection. All I mean is that we shouldn't behave like rabbits and put our complete trust in doctors. For instance, I'm reading this book. He picked up a large open book from the windowsill. Abrekozov and Stryokov, Pathological Anatomy, Medical School Textbook. It says here that the link between the development of tumors and central nervous system has so far been very little studied. And this link is an amazing thing. It's written here in so many words. He found the place. It happens rarely, but there are cases of self-induced healing. You see how it's worded. Not recovery through treatment, but actual healing, see? There was a stir throughout the ward. It was as though self-induced healing had fluttered out of the great open book like a rainbow-colored butterfly for everyone to see, and they held up their foreheads and cheeks for its healing touch as it flew past. Self-induced, said Kostoglatov, laying aside his book. He waved his hands, fingers splayed, keeping his legs in the same guitar-like pose. That means that suddenly, for some unexplained reason, the tumor starts off in the opposite direction. It gets smaller, resolves, and finally disappears, see? They were all silent, gaping at the fairy tale that a tumor, one's own tumor, the destructive tumor which had mangled one's whole life, should suddenly drain away, dry up, and die by itself? 
they were all silent, still holding their faces up to the butterfly. It was only the gloomy Podiev who made his bed creak, and with a hopeless and obstinate expression on his face, croaked out. I suppose for that you'd need to have a clear conscience. It was not clear to everyone whether his words were linked to their conversation or were some thought of his own. But Pavel Nikolaevich, who on this occasion was listening to his neighbor, Bonesure, with attention, even with a measure of sympathy, turned with a nervous jerk to Podiev and read him a lecture. What idealistic nonsense! What's conscience got to do with it? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, comrade Podiev. But Kostoglatov followed it up straight away. You've hit the nail on the head, Yefrem. Well done. Anything can happen. We don't know a damn thing. For example, after the war, I read something very interesting in a magazine. I think it was Zvezda. There's an asterisk next to Zvezda. Uh, apparently, Zvezda, star, is a well-known literary monthly which attracted official criticism after the war because of its liberalism. It seems that man has some kind of blood and brain barrier at the base of his skull, so long as the substance or microbes that kill a man can't get through that barrier into the brain, he goes on living. So what does that depend on? The young geologist had not put down his book since he had come into the ward. He was sitting with one on his bed by the other window near Kostoglatov, occasionally raising his head to listen to the argument. He did so now. All the guests from the other wards were listening too, as well as those who belonged there. Near the stove, Federal, his neck still unmarked and white, but already doomed, lay curled up on his side, listening from his pillow. Well, it depends, apparently, on the relationship between the potassium and sodium salts in the barrier. If there's a surplus of one of these salts, I don't remember which one, let's say sodium, then nothing harmful can get through the barrier and the man won't die. But if, on the other hand, there's a surplus of potassium salts, then the barrier won't do its work and he dies. What does the proportion of potassium to sodium depend on? That's the most interesting point. Their relationship depends on a man's attitude of mind. Understand? It means that if a man's cheerful, if he is staunch, then there's a surplus of sodium in the barrier, and no illness whatsoever can make him die. But the moment he loses heart, there's too much potassium, and you might as well order the coffin. The geologist had listened to him with a calm expression, weighing him up. He was like a bright, experienced student who can guess more or less what the teacher is going to write next on the blackboard. The physiology of optimism, he said approvingly. A good idea, very good. Then, as if anxious not to lose time, he dived back into his book. Pavel Nikolaevich didn't raise any objection now. Bonesure was arguing quite scientifically, so I wouldn't be surprised, Kostoglatov continued, if in a hundred years' time they discover that our organism excretes some kind of cesium salt when our conscience is clear, but not when it's burdened, and then it depends on this cesium salt whether the cells grow into a tumor, or whether the tumor resolves. Yefrem sighed hoarsely. I've mucked so many women about, left them with children hanging round their necks. They cried, mine'll never resolve. What's that got to do with it? Pavel Nikolaevich suddenly lost his temper. The whole idea is sheer religious rubbish. You've read too much slush, comrade Pudiev. You've disarmed yourself ideologically. You keep harping on about that stupid moral perfection. What's so terrible about moral perfection? said Kostoglatov aggressively. Why should moral perfection give you such a pain in the belly? 
It can't harm anyone except someone who's a moral monstrosity. You, watch what you're saying. Pavel Nikolaevich flashed his spectacles with their glinting frames. He held his head straight and rigid, as if the tumor wasn't pushing it under the right of the jaw. There are questions on which a definite opinion has been established, and they are no longer open to discussion. Why can't I discuss them? Kostolgotov glared at Rusonov with his large, dark eyes. Come on, that's enough, shouted the other patients, trying to make peace. All right, comrade, whispered the man without a voice from Dionka's bed. You were telling us about birch fungus. But neither Rusonov nor Kostolgotov was ready to give way. They knew nothing about one another, but they looked at each other with bitterness. If you wish to state your opinion, at least employ a little elementary knowledge, Pavel Nikolaevich pulled his opponent up, articulating each word syllable by syllable. The moral perfection of Leo Tolstoy and company was described once and for all by Lenin and by Comrade Stalin and by Gorky. Excuse me, answered Kostolgotov, restraining himself with difficulty. He stretched one arm out toward Rusonov. No one on this earth ever says anything once and for all. If they did, life would come to a stop and succeeding generations would have nothing to say. Pavel Nikolaevich was taken aback. The tops of his delicate white ears turned quite red, and round red patches appeared on his cheeks. He shouldn't be expostulating, entering into a Saturday afternoon argument with this man. He ought to be checking up on who he was, where he came from, where his background was, and whether his blatantly false views weren't a danger in the post he occupied. I am not claiming, Kostolgotov hastened to unburden himself, that I know a lot about social science. I haven't had much occasion to study it. But with my limited intelligence, I understand that Lenin only attacked Tolstoy for seeking moral perfection when it led society away from the struggle with arbitrary rule and from the approaching revolution. Fine, but why try to stop a man's mouth? He pointed with both his large hands to Putyev. Just when he started to think about the meaning of life, when he himself is on the borderline between life and death, why should it irritate you so much if it helps himself by reading Tolstoy? What harm does it do? Or perhaps you think Tolstoy should have been burned at the stake. Perhaps the government, Synod, there's a asterisk next to Synod. Tolstoy was excommunicated by the Holy Synod, the ruling body of the Russian Orthodox Church under the Tsars. Perhaps the government Synod didn't finish his work? Kostolgotov, not having studied social science, had mixed up holy and government. Both Pavel Nikolaevich's ears had now ripened to a full, rich, juicy red. This was a direct attack on a government institution. True, he had not quite heard which institution. The fact that it was made in front of a random audience, not hand-picked, made the situation more serious still. What he had to do now was stop the argument, tactfully, and check up on Kostoglatov at the very first opportunity, so he did not make an issue of it. Let him read Ostrovsky. That'll do him more good. There's uh, two asterisks next to Ostrovsky. Nikolai Ostrovsky, a Soviet writer whose most important character attempted to be of use to the party, even from his deathbed. So I guess Nikolai Ostrovsky was somebody who was a hardcore party member, even on his deathbed. But Kostogotov did not appreciate Pavel Nikolaevich's tact. Without listening or taking in anything, the other said, he continued recklessly, putting forward his own ideas to an unqualified audience. Why stop a man from thinking? After all, what does our philosophy of life boil down to? Oh, life is so good. Life, I love you. Life is for happiness. What profound sentiments. 
Any animal can say as much without our help. Any hen, cat, or dog. Please, I beg you, Pavel Nikolaevich was warning him now, not out of civil duty, not as one of the great actors on the stage of history, but as its meanest extra. We mustn't talk about death. We mustn't remind anyone of it. It's no use begging, Kostolgatov waved him aside with a spade-like hand. If we can't talk about death here, where on earth can we? Oh, I suppose we live forever. So what? What of it? pleaded Pavel Nikolaevich. What are you suggesting? You want us to talk and think about death the whole time? So that the potassium salts get the upper hand? Not at all, Kostogotov said, rather more quietly, seeing he was beginning to contradict himself. Not all the time, only sometimes. It's useful because what do we keep telling a man all his life? You're a member of the collective. You're a member of the collective. That's right, but only while he's alive. When the time comes for him to die, we release him from the collective. He may be a member, but he has to die alone. It's only he who is saddled with the tumor, not the whole collective. Now you, yes, you. He poked his finger rudely at Rosonov. Come on, tell us. What are you most afraid of in the world now? Of dying? What are you most afraid of talking about? Of death? And what do we call that? Hypocrisy. Within limits, that's true. The nice geologist spoke quietly, but everyone heard him. We're so afraid of death. We drive away all thought of those who have died. We don't even look after their graves. Well, that's right, Rusanov agreed. Monuments to heroes should be properly maintained. They even say so in the newspapers. Not only heroes, everyone, said the geologist gently in a voice, which it seemed he was incapable of raising. It wasn't only his voice that was thin. He was too. His shoulders gave no hint of physical strength. Many of our cemeteries are shamefully neglected. I saw some in the Altai Mountains and over toward Novosibirsk. There are no fences. The cattle wander into them, and pigs dig them up. Is that part of our national character? No. We always used to respect graves. To revere graves, added Kostolgotov. Pavel Nikolaevich had stopped listening. He had lost interest in the argument. Forgetting himself, he had made an incautious movement, and his tumor had given him such a jab of reverberating pain in the neck and head that he was no longer concerned with enlightening these bodies and exploding their nonsense. After all, it was only by chance he had landed in this clinic. He shouldn't have had to live through such a crucial period of his illness in the company of people like this. But the main, the most terrible thing was that the tumor had not subsided or softened in the least after his injection the day before. The very thought gave him a cold feeling in the belly. It was all very well for Bone Chewer to talk about death. He was getting better. Dionka's guest, the portly man without a voice, sat there holding his larynx to ease the pain. Several times he tried to intervene with something of his own or to interrupt the unpleasant argument, but nobody could hear his whisper, and he was unable to talk any louder. All he could do was lay two fingers on his larynx to lessen the pain and help the sound. Diseases of the tongue and throat, which made it impossible to talk, are somehow particularly oppressive. A man's whole face becomes no more than an imprint of his oppression. Dayomka's guest now tried to stop the argument, making wide sweeps of his arms. Even his tiny voice was now more easily heard. He moved forward along the passageway between the beds. Comrades, comrades! He wheezed huskily. Even though the pain in his throat was not your own, you could feel it still. 
Don't let's be gloomy. We're depressed enough by our illnesses, as it is. Now you, comrade. He walked between the beds and almost beseechingly stretched out one hand as if to a deity. The other was still at his throat, toward the disheveled Kostoglatov sitting high. You were telling us such interesting things about birch fungus. Please go on. Come on, Oleg. Tell us about the birch fungus. What was it you said? Sibgatov was asking. The bronze-skinned knee could only move his tongue with difficulty because part of it had dropped off during his previous course of treatment and the rest had now swollen. But indistinctly, he too was asking Kostogatov to continue. The others were asking him to as well. A disturbing feeling of lightness ran through Kostogatov's body. For years, he had been used to keeping his mouth shut, his head bowed and his hands behind his back in front of men who were free. It had become almost a part of his nature, like a stoop you are born with. He hadn't rid himself of it even after a year in exile. Even now, it seemed the natural, simple thing to clasp his hands behind his back when he walked along the paths of the hospital grounds. But now these free men, who for so many years had been forbidden to talk to him as an equal, to discuss anything serious with him, as one man to another, or even more bitter, to shake hands with him, or take a letter from him, these free men were sitting in front of him, suspecting nothing, while he lounged casually on a windowsill, playing the schoolmaster. They were waiting for him to bolster up their hopes. He also realized that he no longer set himself apart from free men, as he used to, but was joining them in the common misfortune. In particular, he had grown out of the habit of speaking to a lot of people, of addressing any kind of conference, session, or meeting. And yet, here he was, becoming an orator. It all seemed wildly improbable to Kostoglatov, like an amusing dream. He was like a man charging full tilt across ice, who has to rush forward, come what may. And so, carried by the cheerful momentum of his recovery, unexpected, but it seemed real, he went on and on. Friends, he said, with uncharacteristic volubility. This is an amazing tale. I heard it from a patient who came in for a checkup while I was still waiting to be admitted. I had nothing to lose, so straight away I sent off a postcard with this hospital's address on it for the reply. And an answer has come today, already. Only twelve days, and an answer. Dr. Meslenikov even apologizes for the delay because it seems he has to answer on the average ten letters a day. And you can't write a reasonable letter in less than half an hour, can you? So he spends five hours a day just writing letters, and he doesn't get a thing for it. No, and what's more, he has to spend four rubles a day on stamps, Dayamka interjected. That's right, four rubles a day, which means a hundred and twenty a month, and he doesn't have to do it. It's not his job. He just does it as a good deed. Or how should I put it? Kostogatov turned maliciously toward Rusanov. A humane act, is that right? But Pavel Nikolaevich was finishing reading a newspaper report of the budget. He pretended not to hear. And he has no staff, no assistants or secretaries. He does it all on his own. And he doesn't get any honor or glory either. You see, when we're ill, a doctor is like a ferryman. We need him for an hour, and after that we forget he exists. As soon as he cures you, you throw his letters away. At the end of his letter, he complains that his patients, especially the ones he's helped, stop writing to him. They don't tell him about the doses they take or the results. And then he goes on to ask me to write to him regularly. He's the one who asks me when we should be bowing down before him. In his heart, Kostogatov was convincing himself that he had been warmly touched by Moslenikov's selfless industry, 
and that he wanted to talk about him and praise him, because it would mean he wasn't entirely spoiled himself. But he was already spoiled to the extent that he would not have been able to put himself out like Maslenikov day after day for other people. Tell us everything in the proper order, Oleg, said Sibgatov, with a faint smile of hope, how he wanted to be cured. In spite of the numbing, obviously hopeless treatment, month after month and year after year, suddenly and finally to be cured, to have his back healed again, to straighten himself up, walk with a firm tread, be a fine figure of a man. Hello, Ludmila Afansievna, I'm all right now. They all longed to find some miracle doctor or some medicine the doctors here didn't know about. Whether they admitted as much or denied it, they all without exception in the depths of their hearts believed there was a doctor or a herbalist or some old witch of a woman somewhere whom you only had to find and get that medicine from to be saved. No, it wasn't possible. It just wasn't possible that their lives were already doomed. However much we laughed at miracles when we are strong, healthy, and prosperous, if life becomes so hedged and cramped that only a miracle can save us, then we clutch at this unique, exceptional miracle and believe in it. And so, Gostoglatov identified himself with the eagerness with which friends were hanging on his lips and began to talk fervently, believing his own words even more than he'd believed the letter when he'd first read it to himself. Well, to start from the beginning, Shirov, here it is. One of our old patients told me about Dr. Maslenikov. He said that he was an old pre-revolutionary country doctor from the Alexandrov district near Moscow. He'd worked dozens of years in the same hospital, just like they used to do in those days. And he noticed that although more and more was being written about cancer in medical literature, there was no cancer among the peasants who came in. Now, why was that? Yes, why was that? Which of us from childhood has not shuddered at the mysterious, at contact with the impenetrable yet yielding wall behind which there seems to be nothing? Yet from time to time, we catch a glimpse of something which might be someone's shoulder or else someone's hip in our everyday, open, reasonable life, where there is no place for mystery, it suddenly flashes at us. Don't forget me, I'm here. So he began to investigate. He began to investigate, repeated Kostoglatov. He never repeated anything, but now found pleasure in doing so. And he discovered a strange thing, that the peasants in his district saved money on their tea, and instead of tea brewed up a thing called chaga, or, in other words, birch fungus. You mean brown cap? Podiev interrupted him. In spite of the despair he'd resigned himself to and shut himself up in for the last few days, the idea of such a simple, easily accessible remedy burst upon him like a ray of light. The people around him were all southerners and had never in their lives seen a birch tree, let alone the brown cap mushroom that grows under it. So they couldn't possibly know what Kostogatov was talking about. No, Yefram, not a brown cap. Anyway, it's not really a birch fungus. It's a birch cancer, you remember. On old birch trees, there are these peculiar growths, like spines, black on top and dark brown inside. Tree fungus, then? Yefram persisted. They used to use it for kindling fires, well, perhaps. Anyway, Sergei Nikitich Maslenikov had an idea. Mightn't it be that the same chaga that had cured the Russian peasants of cancer for centuries without their even knowing it? You mean they use it as a prophylactic? The young geologist nodded his head. He hadn't been able to read a line all evening, but the conversation had been worth it. But it wasn't enough just to make a guess, you see. Everything had to be checked. He had to spend many, many years watching the people who were drinking the homemade tea and the ones who weren't. Then 
He had to give it to people who developed tumors, take the responsibility for not treating them with other medicines, and he had to guess what temperature the tea ought to be at, and what sort of dose, and whether it should be boiled or not, how many glasses they ought to drink, whether there'd be any harmful after effects, and which tumors it helped most and which least. And all this took. Yes, but what about now? What happens now? said Sibgatov excitedly. And Dayamka thought, could it really help his leg? Could it possibly save it? What happens now? Well, here's his answer to my letter. He tells me how to treat myself. Have you got his address? asked the voiceless man eagerly, keeping one hand over his wheezing throat. He was already taking a notebook and fountain pen from his jacket pocket. Does he say how to take it? Does he say if it's any good for throat tumors? Pavel Nikolaevich would have liked to maintain his strength of will and punish his neighbor by a show of utter contempt, but he found he couldn't let such a story and such an opportunity slip. He could no longer go on working out the meaning of the figures of the 1955 draft state budget, which had been presented to a session of the Supreme Soviet. By now he had frankly lowered his newspaper and was slowly turning his face toward Bonechewer, making no attempt to conceal his hope that he, a son of the Russian people, might also be cured by this simple Russian folk remedy. He spoke with no trace of hostility. He didn't want to irritate Bonechewer, yet there was a reminder in his voice. But is this method officially recognized? he asked. Has it been approved by a government department? High up on his windowsill, Kostolotov grinned. I don't know about government departments. This letter, he waved in the air, a small yellowish piece of paper with green ink writing on it, is a business letter, how to make the powder, how to dissolve it. But I suppose if it had been passed by the government, the nurses would already be bringing it to us to drink. There'd be a barrel of the stuff on the landing, and we wouldn't have to write to Alexandrov. Alexandrov, the voiceless man, had already written it down. What postal district? What street? He was quick to catch on. Amajan was also listening with interest and managing to translate the most important bits quietly to Mersolimov and Egenbirdev. Amazhin did not need the birch fungus himself because he was getting better, but there was one thing he didn't understand. If the mushroom's that good, why don't the doctors indent for it? Why don't they put it in their standing orders? It's a long business, Amazhin. Some people don't believe in it. Some don't like learning new things, and so are obstructive. Some try to stop it to promote their own remedies, but we don't have any choice. Kostoglatov answered Rusanov and answered Amazhin, but he didn't answer the voiceless man or give him the address. So that no one would notice this, he pretended he hadn't quite heard him or didn't have time to answer, but in fact, he didn't want to give him the address. He didn't want to, because there was something insinuating about the voiceless man's attitude, respectable though he looked. He had the figure and face of a bank manager, or even of the premier of a small South American country. Oleg felt sorry for the honest old Maslenikov, who was ready to give up his sleep to write to people he didn't know. The voiceless man would shower him with questions. On the other hand, it was impossible not to feel sorry for this wheezing throat, which had lost the ring of a human voice, unvalued when we have it. But there again, Kostogotov had learned how to be ill. He was a specialist in being ill. He was devoted to his illness. He had already read bits of pathological anatomy and managed to get explanations out of Gangart or Donsova, and he'd gotten an answer from Maslenikov. Why would he, the one who for years had been deprived of all rights, be expected to teach these free men how to wriggle out from underneath the boulder that was crushing them? His character had been formed in a place where the law dictated. 
Found it. Keep your trap shut. Grabbed it. Keep it under the mattress. If everyone started writing to Maslenikov, Kostogotov would never get another reply to his own letters. It was not a deeply thought out decision. Fuck. Sorry, everyone on Periscope. I just received a call. <laughs>